All right, guys, welcome to the March Lunch and Learn. Um, we have a little presentation that Kyle and Kelly Davis had put together for us on treating the tennis athlete. <laughs> so without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Kyle. Hi. Good morning, everybody. We're here in beautiful Mission Hills in Rancho Mirage, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm here with Kelly, Dr. Kelly Davis, right? Yep. Hey, this, she's got great experience and we're really going to enjoy her tennis expertise. She was actually a physical therapist on the WTA, is that correct? Yep, that's correct. What years were, were you that? 2013 to 2016. Awesome. So do you know how to treat the tennis player? I sure do. And we're going to get, get some tips from her today. And over here we have Christina Lynn. She is our model today and she's going to be a soon to be doctor of physical therapy from St. Augustine College. Okay, here we go. Okay, so now we're going to really focus today on the elbow. A lot of tennis injuries are coming from the elbow. So I just want to give just a brief elbow uh, evaluation. And uh, after I've already gone through the subjective, I'm going to go from the least provocative testing to the most provocative testing. So in other words, if I feel like it's a, a ligament, I'm going to test the ligament last. If I feel it might be lateral epicondylitis, I'm going to test the muscles last. If I feel it's a nerve, I'm going to test the nerves last, okay? So what we're going to do is I'm going to first start out by just taking her elbow range of motion. We're going to take both elbows out just like this, both arms. And I want her to just go ahead and just go into full elbow flexion and then full elbow extension. And I'm going to see from the side because a lot of times our tennis players or baseball players, they might lose a little bit of elbow extension. So it's very important that I like to take a look at it at 90 degrees versus coming on down here. I can't really see, I, that looks like maybe zero, but there's a big difference between here and now in this position there. So we're gonna take a look at this here and we're gonna bring that on down, okay? Next thing I wanna do is I actually wanna feel that elbow range of motion. So I'm gonna take it all the way back and I'm gonna give her a little overpressure and I'm gonna come all the way here this way and I'm gonna give her a little overpressure here. Okay, not going into a valve extension, but I do want to test to see what that range of motion feels like. I also want to feel the quality of the movement, so I want to know if I can go slow or if I can go fast. And I should be able to go pretty fast with this with the elbow. I'm going to take it on down here, and then I'm going to take a look at full supination, and then we're going to go into full pronation. Okay, so now this is what we're looking at at the elbow. Okay, go. Okay, so now. We're going to test the nerves and this is how just basically we're going to do it just real quick so you're going to take your right arm up just take your right arm up here take it out to the side bend your elbow up put that palm towards me okay and we're going to test our median nerve first so go all the way towards your ear and i want you to put the hand palm that way yep and now i want you to go all the way straight out so this is going to stretch the median nerve okay now we're going to take that palm all the way down elbow all the way straight Tuck your thumb into your fist, turn that fist down toward the floor, and then turn it back towards the green over there. Good. So now we're going to test the radial nerve, and now we're going to test the ulnar nerve, and we're just going to take the palm out, bring the wrist up, bring the elbow all the way to your ear. Okay? Now, if these are going to be irritating, I might even want to do a tenel right on her ulnar nerve if she has some ulnar neuritis going on. Okay? So the next exam we're going to do, we're going to test her, her ligament here. So we're going to go in here to her elbow. It's going to be about 30 degrees. I'm going to come in here and almost like do a drawer sign in which I'm going to do. And this is a valgus at 30, so I got to really bump it up against there. I'm going to do a varus at 30. Boom. And then I'm going to go ahead and take her here. And I'm going to take her into 90-90. And I'm going to bring her elbow in. And so now, maybe if you can come from the side. You'll be able to see we're going to go into the moving valgus. So I'm going to get her into external rotation. I'm going to push medially that way as I bring her arm all the way around. So it's a circular motion I'm bringing. I'm getting that stress right in here. A positive is going to be where she says, ouch, like right in this area. Not ouch here, not ouch here. She's going to have to point to right in that position. Then the last one I'm going to do, because if she looked like she was a little bit like this with her elbow extension and it was a little bit short, I definitely want to do a, a um, valve extension overload. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that elbow into full, 90, full extension, but I'm going to bang it. 
and I should get a good hard end feel with that. So somebody who has like a little bursitis or some swelling back there um, is going to be very, it's going to be very painful for that person. Okay, so now we're going to test her common extensor tendon, her lateral epicondylitis, very common. But this is a great way to show the patient how well they're doing and if they're progressing, or I can also assess the severity of the lateral epicondylitis. So I'm gonna take her in like six different positions. We'll do this real quick. We're gonna go shorten elbow, shorten wrist. Go ahead and hold it there until I push it down. Good, our second position is going to be right here. Hold it there. And then our third position is gonna be down and now push up. So now we're really lengthening this. Then we're gonna go ahead and take that elbow all the way straight. Bring it up here, hold it, middle one, hold it, and then the third one, push it up toward the ceiling, okay? So now we know like what part of her um, common extensor tendon and how severe it is um, based on the different um, provocations to that common extensor tendon. Okay, then the next thing is, I guess we can pause. Okay. So one of the things is it's not always about wrist extension because if I look over here and let's just take a look, if she's like squeezing her, her hands here, right? And this should all be the common flexor tendon, right? That's what we're expecting. So go ahead and squeeze those hands tight. But let's take a look at her now. Let's go ahead and squeeze. And all of this is coming from her common extensor tendon. So go ahead and squeeze back and forth. So this is what we'll see when somebody's gripping the racket too tight or swinging the club too tight or gripping the steering wheel too tight. It's actually, even though that these are the flexors, you're getting a lot of extensor stabilization on this side. So we know also that with the, with the tennis, you're seeing a lot of the forehands really coming over and really pronating, or even with golf, they're really getting into that pronation. So instead of it being a, um, a UCL, it could be just a, a pronator teres tendonitis. And so the way I like to do that, I like to get that pronator teres in like the stretch position here, and then you're gonna go all the way over to this way, okay? So go ahead and turn, the, turn your hand over, over, keep going, keep going, keep going. So at any time in the range, and if she points to the area of the pronator um, muscle, it's going to be like where I'm gonna suspect that a little bit more, and based on her history. But I don't wanna do it where she's really gripping my hand here, grip my hand and turn it over, because again, all the muscles are going to like kick in. So go ahead and pull it over again. Good, and then we're gonna do the same thing with supination. Go ahead and now go ahead and you're gonna turn it all the way up this way. Ready, go ahead and push over, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. So I'd rather do a moving test versus just to hold it there, but let me move it like that, okay? So I really like the actual movement. Three. So Kyle did a really great job of assessing the elbow and the wrist, but we really need to take a look at why the elbow is taking so much load and the mechanics of it. So Kyle assessed the joint below. I also wanna go up and assess the joint above and look at what's happening with the glenohumeral joint and the scapulothoracic joint to see if some of that is causing the breakdown of the elbow. So one of the first things we wanna assess is scapulohumeral rhythm, okay? If they're having any sort of dyskinesis in the movement when they elevate. So I'm gonna have you pinch the inferior angle of both scapulas, and I'm going to have Christina, you lift your arm straight forward for me all the way overhead. We're gonna watch what they do in the upward motion, and more importantly, we're gonna watch what they do in the downward motion, okay? If you watch them side by side, she comes up nicely, but when she comes down, there's a little bit of delay on the right side. Go out to the side, please. Usually it's a little more pronounced in abduction than it is in flexion, depending on the athlete. She looks pretty good here. If you have a high level athlete that is strong, you may have to have them perform this with weights and with high repetitions before you'll see some of that breakdown. But that's what's happening. They're playing their sport for a long period of time. And as those muscles are fatiguing out, the mechanics break down. And that's where you'll start to see that dysfunction. So after assessing the scapulohumeral rhythm, the next thing we want to assess is their posture, okay? Are they super protracted? Are they winging at all? Do they have this inter interiorly rotated humeral head? And what is their pec minor doing? Is it pulling the whole complex forward, okay? Sitting in this complex is gonna put them in a very impinged position. And then you get some of those novice players or even intermediate players who instead of coming up in this nice open plane, will really pull it back and impinge through here in the posterior cuff, and it's going to be in that closed pack position as they're trying to accelerate up through their shot. 
Okay, so we wanna work on resetting how they hold their shoulder here, okay? And allowing them to be in that more open pack position as they're coming through and accelerating. Okay, so the other thing that we'll commonly see is that when players are coming up and through their stroke, when they get to the top, they'll get a big snap at their wrist without any follow through, okay? So the motion to generate power should be a full core and body movement instead of just this upper whip and snap here, which will put a lot of force through the elbow and through the shoulder, okay? So making sure in their strokes and in their serves that they are really planting through their legs, using their core and unloading some of the stress through the shoulder and the elbow. Okay, go ahead. So another thing that we want to consider when we're looking at the tennis athletes specifically is their mechanics as a whole, especially with their serves or with their heavy topspin forehands, okay? Specifically with the QL and the psoas are the two muscles that are most involved and how it jams up the facets in the back. So if you're looking at a service motion, okay, they come back, and this is for a right-handed tennis player, and they're going to jam in through the QL here, okay, and as they're exploding through, they're loading the psoas in the front. Okay, and that follow through motion. Same thing with a heavy, especially Western grip. They're gonna come around, okay, load that QL into this position, and then whip it through, okay? Those imbalances of muscles will cause the facets in the back to jam up and lock up, and we need to figure out how to assess those. So the one thing that we wanna assess is SI mobility and facet joint mobility with forward flexion to see if there's any of those opening or closing restrictions. So what I do is I gently place my thumbs right on her SI joints, and then I'm gonna have you bend forward, Christina. And I just let my thumbs go wherever they're going to go. Come on back up. So not a lot of movement there. Then we go up a joint. Go ahead and bend forward. Now we're on those lumbar facets. A little bit of more of that left coming up. Come on up. Okay, and then we keep going up, repeating this pattern, looking for any hypermobilities. That one's a little bit more, okay? She has a right side opening dysfunction here of opening up those facet joints, okay? We want to have the patient lying on their side with the restricted side down, okay? So if it was her right side that was restricted, we have her laying on her right side. I'm gonna take both of her knees. I put them right on my top of my thigh here, and it allows us to bend forward and feel her facets. So I start right at the SI joint, and we go up one, two, which is where we found that restriction, okay? And we're gonna move her up into knee or hip flexion to get her knees as close to her chest till we feel that full opening of the joint there, okay? Next step, I'm gonna have her straighten her bottom leg onto the table, okay? Move her as needed. And then we fully rotate her open to lock it out, okay? Once we're in this position, we'll start the muscle energy technique where I pop in here, okay? I'm resting her knee right on the top of my hip. I have one hand that's gonna hold her knee into extension or her hip into extension, both really. And then we go back and palpate that facet one more time. And then I'm gonna have you, Christina, push your knee into my chest here. Push, 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 and then relax. Take up any slack as we go. You'll actually be able to feel that facet gapping in there on the bottom part. Push, 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 and relax. Take up the slack, and then one more. Push, usually a five second hold, and then relax it down, okay? Okay, so we also wanna review how to release that psoas muscle. Okay, so remember the psoas sits deep in the front, so I kind of go right under where the rib cage ends there, and it's between the ASIS and the front, and we literally have to do a lateral glide down and in. I'm at a 45 degree angle down to sit into the edge of that psoas muscle. It is not comfortable, it feels very crampy, but if you hold it and let it release like a trigger point, they will get a lot of relief. Okay, and the last muscle we want to assess and release if it's indicated is the quadratus lumborum. So again, kind of between the rib cage and the top of the hip here is where it sits and it's deep in the side. So we want to really get our thumbs and side glide down into the edge. You can feel the border of the muscle, okay? So I always start up high, kind of under the rib cage, and we side glide down and in. You'll feel that knife's resistance. Hold and release, and you can work your way down the muscle to where it attaches. 
not comfortable. They won't like you. Okay. So you can see my pressure is literally straight down and you can see the, the edge of the muscle there. Okay, so now that you've seen um, a few tips already, we're going to go into the how to treat that lateral epicondylitis. And we see that so many times with so many of our amateur tennis players and stuff, right? But you know what's curious to me is like, why do we not see it in the professional player? Like, why, does, why don't you see one professional player have an elbow strap around them? Like, why, why is that? Like, they, see, they hit so many balls. Why is that? It's their biomechanics. They have good biomechanics, right? So... What we see in the amateur athlete is that they're either gripping it too hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, or they're stopping their swing. So there's like a huge eccentric load on those common extensors instead of just like following all the way through it, right? And they only really grip that racket tight, not even tight, it's just firm right at the point of impact, right? Correct. So, so that's why we always like kind of like tell these guys, our, our amateurs, hey, go and see your pro because you might have to work on the grip of the racket primarily, okay? Mm -hmm. Kelly, show us some of your go-to uh, uh, pearls that you wanna show us regarding lateral epicondylitis. Sure. All right, so Christine, Christina has pretty bad lateral epicondylitis, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we take care of her? So one of the techniques I like to use a lot is instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization, okay? This is a $12 little scanner tool from Amazon. You don't have to get the Graston brand. And a little bit of emollient, which just helps it glide over the skin. Okay, so we get a little bit that goes a long way. Okay, we find the head of that common extensor tendon. Okay, get a little of emollient on there. Use the scanner at about a 45 degree angle and you can feel some of the imperfections in the tissue. It'll feel a little gritty as you use it. And we work down through the common extensors. Okay. We also want to make sure that we're hitting the head of the pronator teres and make sure there's no impingement of the nerve in there. Okay. Kind of brushing away from where it could pinch through those two heads. Okay. You can also use it on the tricep tendon. Okay. If they have that repetitive extensor mechanism where they're flinging it into full elbow extension, making sure that we're focusing on that as well. So. If she does have inflammation in the posterior elbow, and a lot of times this is from serving, so they'll get a lot of repetitive snapping of the elbow as they release, right? So when they right at impact, they'll really get into that snap position, but they'll do it over a hundred times and stuff. So what I like to do is take it here, and if she says, ouch, she's saying ouch right now. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Okay, so we're gonna get onto the posterior elbow. So. Let's go ahead and we'll get you to lay down onto your stomach. And you can pause right there. Okay, so now I'll put her in the prone position and I'll take her elbow and I'm gonna get as deep as I can into this, uh, what I feel is like almost like the Olecranon fossa. So I'm gonna take some of this cool, uh, what do you call it? Emollient. Emollient, cool emollient right in here. And I can start out by maybe doing a little bit of the instrument assist. Oh man, that doesn't feel good. Yeah, that's all gritty. So we can get in here. We can kind of work a little bit on the triceps, but I really want to get into my thumbs and really try and push out any type of fluid or swelling that's getting trapped in that posterior in that olecranon fossa. So I really have to like get my thumb here and I'm going to dig down deep and I'm going to push up and out. Okay. You feel that? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times this will start out as very tender, even if you're just putting in like mild to moderate pressure. But as you, as you go on with your treatment, you can get even deeper and deeper into there. So you're really trying to get in here and trying to push a lot of that uh, inflammation out of there. Okay. Okay, so we also wanna look at joint restrictions within the elbow that could be causing a lack of mobility and their ability to fully pronate, supinate, extend, or flex, okay? So one of the ones that I like to do a lot is a radial head mobilization, okay? So you get both thumbs right on the radial head, and we just do a little posterior mobilization, helping to mobilize there. I have her at about 20 degrees of elbow extension, but we can move her up through the range as you're feeling those mobilities, okay? Second one I like to do is a little bit of distraction. 
which is really good for elbow extension. Okay, so one hand is going to go right at the joint. Okay, the other one just stabilizes counter force in the back. Okay, a little bit of distraction down this way, and then the force is going to be this way. So distract and push down. Feel that? Okay. Nice so work. If Christina here has severe elbow tendonitis, the first thing we're gonna do is really kind of like splint this wrist here. So we'll, we'll have her get a wrist splint so that she doesn't really move this wrist at all. And then she's also told not to grip anything like really tight. The next thing we'll do is we can assess to see if the strap is going to like help her. So I'm gonna be the actual strap with my thumb and go into extension with your wrist, hold it there. And we're gonna do that first and she'll say, ouch, ouch, it hurts, okay? But now I'm gonna come in here, she's relaxed. I'm gonna come in here and push down on the common extensor, I mean on the uh, extensor muscles and I'm pushing towards her elbow. So we're gonna shorten the distance here theoretically. And now bring it up, hold it there. And oh my gosh, that feels so much better. So now we can say, let's get that elbow strap for her and then she can start using that throughout her whole daily activities. Well, that was a lot of information, but I still think we have a little bit of more information for you as well, because I understand that now with pickleball is becoming very, very popular. So are you seeing like an increase in injuries from the pickleball court? Oh my gosh, so many people coming in with pickleball injuries. Um, we've had some really extreme ones, like one woman who ruptured her proximal hamstring tendon and had to have it surgically repaired. We see a lot of low back injuries. Um, we've seen a lot of falls and people having fractures, um, trying to chase down balls. And of course we see a lot of lateral epicondylitis because their backhand is one-handed and they're constantly flipping like Just this. Flipping it. And these, these pickleballers, they're, they're kind of going nuts. Like how many times a week do they play? Oh, they'll play for like three hours a day. Three hours a day, like for what, two days a week or? Oh, no, like every day. Every day. Every day they'll and play. This is a whole new generation of senior athletes. Most of them are senior athletes, right? Yeah. And now they're having to get their quick twitch muscles moving again. So you work on agility with these people at all or? No, but I probably should. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's something that we gotta like maybe consider that, you know, they are starting to move a little bit quicker. So in order to avoid some of those falls, a lot of the, uh, the players are at what? 50, 60? 70s. 70s, yeah. 80s. And maybe they haven't been moving for like, you know, like five years and now all of a sudden they're on the pickleball court. So. That's something that I consider then, huh? That's Definitely something to treating, consider. Treating, treating, getting these 80 year olds doing some ladder work, you know what I'm saying? Ladder work, balance work. Yep, perfect. All over the place. So Kelly, really appreciate your time uh, here with us here. And we just love this beautiful weather you're having out here. You guys can't see it, I'll show you real quick. This is her office window. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we just had a great time out here. Uh, the tennis tournament is going on right now. And um, again, we have, whoa. <laughs> and again, we have an expert WTA. And you were, on the, you were on there for how many years? Three years. Three years. And was it pretty glamorous? Not at pretty, all. Not at all. <laughs> It's a long hours and a lot of manual work. A lot of manual work. Mm -hmm. But you enjoyed it? I did. I love my time there and getting to know the players and the athletes. It was really fun and special. So Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you, Kyle, for your time, too. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, well, welcome. We are here with Dr. Alberto Panero, and he is the president of BIOS Ortho Institute. I mean, this guy is legit. He is board certified <laughs> in what? Board certified in sports medicine and PM&R. And, and PM&R. And &R. I mean, this is the guy who I send my peeps to if we need any type of orthobiologics or any type of conservative treatment prior to sending them onto the big ortho. <laughs> so am I the little ortho then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, sir, so what brings you in today? I hear you've been uh, dealing with some issues with your elbow. Yeah, I got this um, lateral epicondylitis, I guess, right here. I've been working with Kyle Yomashiro over at Spine and Sport over there. 
for about four weeks, right? Okay. It's been getting a little bit better, but it's just not there, man. Like, it's, not there. it's not there. So he told me <laughs> to see you to see what you can do about sure. this elbow. And I'm just wondering, is there something that you can do for this elbow? Like, let's go. Yeah. Like, what do you got? What do you got? Well, we're not like, seriously. Like, what do you got for this? Well, there's a lot can of you things. Help me? Can, can, you help can, me? Help you? can you help me? But the first step is yes. making sure we have the correct diagnosis. Gotcha. So let's start with that. So how hey, did you actually? Hey, hey, this yeah. place is sick. Like, can you, <laughs> have you seen this place before? Is this your own place? This is my own place. Yeah. Man, this, this is, is uh, this is pretty sick here. The premier interventional orthopedic office. So you do what here? What kind of injections do you do here? Well, it's not only just injections. Even though we do a lot of platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow concentrate. We also do biologic scaffold, so there's a lot of different things, but everything we do is guided with ultrasound or fluoroscopy, uh, even with needle arthroscopy. So uh, this is bridging the gap between non-surgical orthopedics and obviously surgical orthopedics. It's this middle ground, a, a different way of thinking, but also different procedures that can hopefully bridge the gap between the two. Nice. Yeah, so, so typically people that have lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, uh, hurt on the lateral aspect there. Can you show me where your pain is at? My pain is like right there. Okay, so essentially what we typically see here is that you have a group of extensor muscles that help you extend your wrist and your fingers and they form a common tendon that attaches right at that lateral bacana, which is called the common extensor tendon. So this is typically a tendon issue. So let me have you go this way, straighten your elbow out and lift up. Ah! That gets you going there. Okay, and then don't let me. Ah! Okay, so that really hurts. Okay, so that's a very uh, specific test for this kind of problem, especially when the pain is localized right at the at the point. So the next thing we're gonna do is use musculoskeletal ultrasound to look at the tendon and evaluate the structural integrity of it. Perfect. So what are you doing? So here we're gonna use a linear probe to scan, in this case, in long axis to the tendon. What we're gonna see here right away is we're gonna identify the joint line there. And this is going to be the lateral epicondyle, and this is going to be the common extensor tendon running through there. And you've definitely, you know, have what I'm seeing here, some repetitive stress types of issues because you have a little, what we call an insertional osteophyte, or in more layman's terms, a bone spur that's forming right at the tip of the insertion of the tendon itself. Um, the other thing we're looking for is for the actual integrity of the tendon, so you can see this nice white or hyperechoic fibrillar pattern. We're looking at the, the tendon itself. Uh, there's some areas here of hypoechoic signal. So you do have a little bit of chronic tendinopathy. I'm not appreciating a high grade tear, but certainly this seems to be an overuse injury because um, there had to have been some time where these bone spurs have been forming. Then we're gonna take a look at it in the short axis. And you can again appreciate here that little bone spur. And as I come off of it, you can see the tendon attachment right on top of the bone. So uh, this uh, picture fits with your history, with your physical exam. Your diagnosis is clearly common extensor tendinopathy. So, so can you help me? Can you help me? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the natural course of this, if you were to do no interventions and just physical therapy, conservative care, can take 12 to 18 months to go away on its own. Traditionally, we've done a lot of cortisone injections for these. We've really tried to stop doing those because we saw that those give good short-term improvement, but when it comes back, it's typically worse. And on subsequent imaging, we see more degeneration of the tendon. So if there's a big life event or there's something that you just need a few months of relief for, we can do cortisone, but it's not the typical recommendation. From an interventional standpoint, Platelet-rich plasma has several level one studies noting about a 75 to 85% improvement in pain and symptoms or efficacy, if you will. Uh, what we do there is we draw your blood, centrifuge it, concentrate the platelets, and with ultrasound guidance, we would inject it directly into the tendon. Now that's a very painful procedure to get done. Um, your elbow would be pretty sore for a couple of days to a couple of weeks, and you would need some physical therapy afterwards. One of my favorite approaches, however, is to actually do PRP with uh, percutaneous tenotomy. Uh, there are different devices, one called TenJet, one called TenX, uh, that you can choose, but the idea there is to basically do a micro debridement of the tendon first. So you essentially break down the negative scar tissue that's formed in the tendon, 
and almost uh, clean the bed, if you will, for the PRP to go in there and facilitate some healing. So basically what that's going to do, we cleaned out the tendon. Now the platelets are going to go in there. They're going to release growth factors and cytokines will activate your body's own healing response into the area. Remember, tendons don't have a good blood supply. They don't want to heal very good on their own. So all we're doing in this case is just activating the body's healing response into the tendon. Uh, it's slow. It's going to take about probably four to six weeks to work um, and even two, three months to get the full healing effect. Uh, so there will definitely be a need for activity modification and definitely a lot of physical therapy afterwards. Interesting. So, so is that it? Is there anything else? <laughs> there are some other options that are a little more aggressive and I like to use those in uh, higher grade partial tears. Uh, in those cases, I use a combination of micronized adipose. So I take a little bit of your fat tissue, we <laughs> micronize it down. I don't have any of that. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> And what we do is we inject it as a scaffold, right? So if there's an area of partial tear, the concern is that if we inject PRP or, or bone marrow concentrate, which is a little bit stronger, uh, it's gonna flow in and out of the tear. So the idea here is that we create a biologic scaffold, a little sticky tissue that's a solid that goes into the defect or into the tear so that it sticks there. And then we inject the PRP or bone marrow concentrate and therefore that can form a, a clot in that area with some scaffolding and essentially tries to bridge the gap in between the tissue and hopefully promote a much uh, better healing response. And in tendons, we do actually expect new tendon tissue to, to uh, be promoted and hopefully heal the injured tendon. Wow, smart guy. I think I'll go with you. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness though, uh, I have, uh, recommended a lot of my patients to you with very uh, very good outcomes and we've seen that a few times right where they come in with severe uh, sure. lateral epicondylitis and now that you've been doing it for how long almost eight years now yeah and some of these they've never had a recurrence of that lateral epicondylitis yeah I think that that's really the the key thing with these orthobiologics now I want to clarify PRP and you know stem cell therapies are being used for a lot of different things and they're going to do different things in different diagnoses but specifically for tendon pathology um, I think you actually do promote healing you can actually fix tendinopathy you can heal smaller partial tears and the outcome is that the, the, the problem is resolved and you can return to all the activities that you wanted to do. Man you're a, you're a pretty smart guy do you speak nationally? Yeah, I've been lucky enough and uh, to get to teach all of this stuff, both at the national and international level. International. Um, yep, uh, we have a good presence in South America, a little bit in Europe as well. Um, and obviously from a national perspective, it's, it's not only good to go and teach, but having exposure to being the teacher, also you get exposed to all the other people that are doing it. So you get to you know pick up tidbits from everybody, clinical pearls and things that we can always improve on. Awesome. Thank you, man. <laughs>
And those people would typically get cortisone, which would actually uh, degenerate that tendon uh, in the long run. So this is a great option. I mean, we've had patients that have been severe. And after about like three or four weeks, if we're just not getting any better, then, then we'll go ahead and refer him on to uh, Dr. Panero. Uh, I guess sometimes the tricky thing is sometimes we have to like send them back to their primary to get them to go to Panero. And a lot of patients, it's, I think it's worth it to put, pay cash. I think there's a lot of doctors out there that are, that are doing PRP, but if they're not doing it under ultrasound guidance, I think they're really missing a large part of it. So, um, so yeah, so we've had some really good success uh, with the, with the, with the injections and even with the, the 10 X procedure as well. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? All right, you guys. Well, thanks for attending. And uh, hey, oh, we're late. Hey, last question. Yeah. Hey, do you guys see, or is it common to see a total arm deficit like we do in baseball with tennis players? Is there, is there a pattern of rotation differences? And if so, is it statistically significant for shoulder pain? So are you talking about more of like a, a GERD type of thing? Or are you talking about more of like a, a dead arm type of? Uh, uh, the GERD. The GERD. You're not going to really see that much um, specifically with the, with the um, a tennis player. They don't get into an excessive amount of external rotation in their backswing. And we're primarily talking about the serve. So we don't really see a whole lot of significant where it's been, where it has been a need to address. All right. All right. So very good. So I think we, our next lunch and learn will probably be in a couple months or so. I think we're, we're looking into that. And um, I think you said next month is going to be Rick, Starla. Yep. So the April lunch and learn, we're going to take a pause from the clinical lunch and learns for next month. So it'll be the third Wednesday of next month. So that'll be April 20th. And we're going to be talking about direct access kind of the nuances to direct access and, you know, exactly what that looks like from different clinical scenarios. And we'll actually go through some real patient scenarios as well. So I encourage everyone to join that. That's going to be really helpful for obviously clinicians, but our PCCs, billing staff, uh, everyone to join. And I will send the um, calendar invitation out for that tomorrow.